Well, amen. Well, thank you, Barry, for that last song. One of the good things about doing new songs is sometimes when we're doing those songs that we're familiar with, we we oftentimes will sing those and not really be paying attention to the words. And one of the good things about doing a new song is you're just very conscious of the words. And I just was um, really moved in thinking about those words. And I, I thank God for, for Barry and the way that he leads us um, in worship through song. And tonight, I want us to uh, turn our attention to the Word of God. I want us to go to Matthew chapter 26 tonight. We've completed our, our study of the church covenant. Lord willing, we're going to start a, a new study on the book of James uh, when we return from our break. Um, but tonight, I want us to, uh, to go to Matthew chapter 26 as we uh, consider uh, this beginning of, of Holy Week. Uh, our, our passage that we're going to look at tonight is in verses uh, 6 through 13. It's the record of our our Lord's uh, anointing for burial, and uh, it, it's an interesting. It's interesting to note that the that this account is recorded in uh, three of the four Gospels. It's recorded here in Matthew 26, along with Mark chapter 14 and John chapter 12. Uh, someone may say, well, "What about Luke chapter 7? There's a similar account in Luke chapter 7, um, but there are obvious differences. I just want to kind of highlight a couple of those. Uh, one is the place. Um, Luke 7 is in Galilee, and these other accounts are in uh, Bethany in Judea. Uh, the timing, uh, that account was at the beginning, or I, I should say the middle of our Lord's ministry, while this is right at uh, the end that's leading up to the cross. And, um, and the objections that are given are different, the, the ones that our Lord gives. Um, He's in Luke chapter uh, 7, he speaks of, um, uh, well, I, I, I say that. In Luke chapter 7, I said objections. I kind of got ahead of myself. Um, it's the answer that Jesus gives. The objections are, um, in Luke chapter 7, it speaks of Jesus touching, or the, a sinner touching Jesus. And here it talks about the outrage over the money that um, could have been spent. Uh, it's a waste of money. Uh, the Lord responds to that, again, in Luke chapter 7. Um, he responds with forgiveness towards this woman. But here in these other three accounts, um, he talks about what she has done is, for his, is in preparation for his burial. And so all that to say that Luke is a different account. Uh, it's... Um, a different account entirely. Um, what I want to do tonight is, um, is I want to, I want to get a kind of since we're not coming into this um, through a study. What I'd like to do is just start off in the first few verses of Matthew, just make a couple of remarks as we walk through that, and then we'll read the passage that is the object of our. Um, attention tonight, the focus of our study in verses 6 through 13. But I want to go back to verse 1 of Matthew 26 and make a few uh, contextual remarks. We're obviously familiar with Passion Week, and but in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 1, it says that when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, and I want to stop right there, and I just want to highlight all these words. Uh, this phrase um, that Jesus had finished these words um, is, is somewhat familiar to Matthew. He, he uses that phrase on a couple of occasions. When our Lord has a long discourse, uh, one of the, the cues that that, uh, that is over with and we're moving on to the next section that, that Matthew gives us is he, he tells us that um, Jesus has finished these words. But this is interesting because this is the only time that's here that he uses the word all. When he finished all these words, it, it's, it's like a, a summation. In, in fact, it, it may be an allusion to the fact that he has, t he has spoken to Israel and he's not going to speak anymore. In fact, when we see the next several chapters, what we begin to see is that Jesus 
hardly says anything. It reminds us of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. So, so what we see here is somewhat of a, a transition that's taking place. This is, he, he's no longer in his teaching ministry, but he's, he's transitioning. What we see is that Jesus, in these next several chapters, is doing what he's come to do. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. He's come to make an atonement for his people. And this is the, the, the transition that's taking place. Verse 2, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming. And the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Again, one, one of the interesting things is, is that as he talks about this, and we're going to see this even in the, the passage that we're looking at tonight, that Jesus, rather than a teacher, he almost, it's almost like he's an object. The Son of Man is going to be handed over. Verse 3, the chief priest and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. Notice what Matthew says, that they plotted and they gathered. But I, I, I want to... I want you to notice something, just kind of step back for a minute and notice how this is kind of laying out. That in, that in verse 2, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's telling them that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Notice the way he words that. He says this is going to happen. And Matthew says, then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together. He says what's going to happen, and it happens. It, it almost reminds us of the creation account, where God speaks, and he says, let there be light, and there is light. Jesus said this is going to happen, and we see this happening. And, and I bring that out to emphasize this point, that contrary to what some may think, Jesus is not a victim. Jesus is in control. And Matthew is showing this by the way that he writes this account, that Jesus speaks and it comes to pass. There's nothing passive about the way the Lord Jesus enters into this Passover. There's nothing passive about the way that he is crucified. All of this is part of the sovereign plan of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ is right in the middle of this. And while those around them may think that they're the ones that are orchestrating the events, it is God in heaven who is orchestrating all of this. They plot against him. And the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. Verse 6, and I want us to read this passage in its entirety. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany... At the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume. And she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why, why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her, and this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh, how precious, how lovely is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the one to whom you said, this is my son in whom 
I am well pleased. Oh Lord, I pray tonight that it would please you to allow us through the Spirit of God to, to see him in faith. Lord, that we might truly appreciate him for who he is and all that he has done. Lord, open our eyes, grant us the faith to see. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I mentioned in the opening that this passage takes place in the last week, the events that are leading up to the cross. Just, just a couple of remarks, uh, taking the parallel account in, in mind that John indicates, or he dates this, uh, incident as um, taking place six days before the Passover and says that the, that the triumphal entry happened the next day. I think this is important, and, and I want to emphasize this point, that when you read all the gospel accounts, that this is at the very front. Leading up into Passion Week, that this is at the very top. And, and what is it that, it that each of these gospel writers are communicating by putting this story at the beginning. And certainly, as we're emphasizing tonight, it is, uh, or as our Lord emphasized, uh, that what she did is preparing him for his burial. But I, I think also what we see in this is that we see the value and the worth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this passage really screams that as we walk through it. Well, as you consider what is here, and taking the other accounts in mind, we learned that not only Mary was here, and Martha, as John tells us, and Lazarus, the, the brother of Martha and Mary, that all three of them are there. And Matthew tells us that this takes place in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper. All three are there. We know that they lived in Bethany. They're at the home of Simon the leper. And a lot of people have put this together, and they think, a lot of scholars think this, that, that perhaps um, those three siblings, that Simon the leper was their father. We're not told that, and that's just a, uh, an estimation of, of what we see here. But all of this is taking place at this house. There are a lot of other details that are in the other passages of Scripture, but I, I, I'll, I'll hint at some of them as we walk through this. But what I want to do is just walk through this, make a couple of remarks right up front about our Lord as we kind of walk to the beginning of this. And then I just want to, as we walk through the text, just really bring out some, some lessons and some application for us. There's a lot that's here. But the first thing I want us to note is... Um, there in verse number six is that Jesus is at, is at the home of the cleansed. And I say that because what the scripture says is that Jesus was at the home of Simon the leper. Now, obviously, Simon the leper did not have leprosy at the time. I mean, you think about what we understand about what the scripture teaches and how they would have been just terrified, fearful, of leprosy because there was no way of curing it. So Simon the leper could not have had the disease at this time. In fact, knowing the law, and we know that Jesus kept every bit of the law, Jesus would not have been permitted, um, according to the law, to be able to have a, a meal there with Simon the leper. And we know he wouldn't have broken the law. So Simon the leper, we might better understand it to be Simon the former leper. Because in that day and time, uh, they certainly, had he been a leper, uh, unlike uh, the way that our government officials handle this with uh, COVID-19, the leper would have been quarantined, not the well. You don't put the healthy people quarantined, y'all right? We don't put the healthy people, we don't quarantine them. The leper would have been quarantined. But they're hang hanging out together. They're all there in the same house. There's a lot of places I could go with this, and certainly there's a correlation between leprosy and sin. We've highlighted some of that before. But I just want to really emphasize one point of that, and that is that uh, someone who had leprosy, and if we're familiar uh, with some of those laws about leprosy that you had to warn people uh, when you were approaching, 
that you were unclean. The emphasis is that those who had leprosy were unclean. Ceremonially, they were unclean. And may I remind you that that is our condition apart from Christ, that we are unclean. But Jesus is in the company of the cleansed. I know it's Wednesday night, but that's a good place to say amen. I mean, Jesus is in the company of those who have been cleansed. He's in our presence even this evening. Second thing I want you to notice is that Jesus was the object of this woman's worship. Verse 7 says that a woman came to him <clears throat> with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. Now, John identifies this woman as Mary. This is the same Mary. You remember Mary and Martha. In fact, John tells us in his account, that Martha is there serving, but she's no longer complaining. But Mary, this Mary, and always we find Mary in this position of worshiping the Lord. That every time it seems like we see Mary, she's always at the feet of Jesus. She comes and she pours this, this costly perfume. She pours it on his head. Now, when a guest would come, and entered into a, a banquet or a supper, uh, it, it, was, it would have been custom for the, to, the, the guest to uh, wash, uh, or the, the host to, to wash the feet of the guest. But what she does, and John points this out, is that not only does she pour it over his head, but it's poured on his feet, and she wipes his feet with her hair. Now, if we know a little bit about Jewish women and hair, one of the things that we know, and Scripture teaches this, is that the glory of a woman is her hair. And, and this speaks of uh, an act of humility. For a woman to let down her hair in public, for her to do this, is unheard of. But Mary is not concerned about what anybody else in that room thinks. She's only concerned about pleasing the Lord. Uh, she, she, this, this humility on her part, as she, she wipes his feet, it, it reveals her, her love, it reveals her adoration of the Lord. It's, it's an expression. And by the way, you cannot, you cannot express an act of worship without some kind of uh, an accompaniment. You, you, there, there must be something. We, we can't say that we truly love the Lord without any actions. Love has taken on a, a connotation today that it's all about feel, feeling and emotion, but love is a verb. It is action. If we truly love the Lord, then there will be some kind of accompanying act. And, and in, with Mary, it, it's almost like Everybody else is not even there. It's just about him. And she comes and she pours this over him. This, uh, we're told here that it's a, a costly perfume. Every one of those gospel accounts makes it very clear that this was a, a very costly perfume. In fact, John tells us that it was a, a pound. It, it's equivalent to 300 denarii. How much is that? Well, a, a denarius is a, a one wage, a one day wage, and so you're talking about almost a, a year's worth is how much this costs. In in our vernacular, we would say this is thousands of dollars, and this is kind of setting up for what we see and how the disciples respond to this. Is that she comes, this this with this alabaster vile, very costly perfume, thousands of dollars in our, in our day and time. And, and in a moment, I mean, we're talking about just, just a couple of minutes, it's over with. She pours it out. She, she, doesn't, 
she doesn't, like a lot of people do with their worship, she doesn't, she doesn't just dole it out with a teaspoon. I mean, I'm just going to give a little bit to the Lord. No, she, she gives everything. It's extravagant. I mean, she's over the top. But again, it's really about him. And you kind of, you, 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 and it's easy to scoff at these disciples. But can't you just see yourself a little bit in that? We want to put ourselves at the center of the story with Mary. But the reality is, is that a lot of us will say, this is, this is, this is a waste. This is, this is too much. But she's unashamed. She loves the Lord. She's not worried about the call. She, in fact, she, she understands who it is that she's pouring this out on. Digging a little deeper into what Mary's active devotion is, is, is notice how Jesus, what he has to say about what she's done. The disciples will come back to them in verses 8 and 9 in a moment. But in verse 12, he says that she did it to prepare him for his burial. Now, I thought much about this. She did it to prepare him for his burial. Now, now was it that, that Jesus is given the explanation of saying, well, she was just doing an act of worship. And so, a, as an act of worship, he, he's, he's interpreting what this means. Or could it mean, and I think this is probably why it's here, and I think, I think it relates to every time the gospel is told, could it be that Mary understands that Jesus is going to die? Now, we read that a moment ago in, the, in verse number two, that he's telling his disciples that he's going to die. He's going to, he's going to be crucified. He's been telling them over and over that this is going to happen, that he's going to die. And, and Mary believes it. She understands. She believes the gospel. And with this, the gospel is going to be told. Every time the gospel is told, the story of her is given in memory of her. She believes the gospel. But the disciples don't believe the gospel yet. They don't understand the gospel yet. Now, in fact, when Judas comes with the soldiers to take our Lord, had they understood, they would have just given him up. But no, they try to fight the, the soldiers that are there because they don't understand, they don't believe. They do not understand the gospel. But Mary does this as an act of worship, as, as a preparation for his burial. Two days it comes the Passover. So, they didn't get it. But she does. They do not really believe, but she does. Jesus is headed to the grave. And her good work is proclaimed with the gospel. And in fact, we can put it this way, that she announces the death of Jesus ahead of time by preparing him for his burial. I think it's interesting that over and over, here we see this woman, and in the, God, in the resurrection account, we see these women, that they're the ones that are testifying about our Lord. So, so women don't ever doubt uh, your place in gospel ministry. Don't, don't ever doubt that you cannot be used of the Lord. Don't ever doubt that you don't have uh, the right to give or share your testimony in the gospel. God used women in the first century, and thank God he used his women in the 21st century as well. But this anointing also indicates something else about Jesus. We just got through um, with 1 Samuel seven years ago, and you recall. And while we were walking through, we saw that David was anointed. And I think there's some significance here that Jesus is anointed, that he is the king. Again, he's in control. He's, he's not one that is a victim, 
but he's the victor. And he looks like he's passive as he's being handed over, as we'll, we'll, you know, as you walk through this account. It looks like he's passive, but he's the good shepherd who lays his life down for a sheep. He lays it down willingly. Again, this is a, a, a costly sacrifice. Thousands of dollars this is worth, and it's extreme extravagance. And it's all poured out in a moment. And the, and the disciples, and I just want to kind of bring this to a close with what we see with the disciples here, is they give a real practical objection. It says in verse number 8 that they were indignant. And this is communicated through uh, the other gospel accounts as well, that they were somewhat disgusted that, that he would do this. This is, this is so excessive, it's so ex extravagant that she would do this. I mean, this could have been invested in the work of the ministry. Could have been given to the poor. Again, it's easy to scoff at them, but this woman who spends a, a year's wages in honoring the Lord Jesus, and she does this voluntarily, and Jesus defends her. And, and again, I think we can hear ourselves a little bit in the disciples. As you look at this situation, you would think, why would you do this? And Jesus answers this about the poor because that's what they were thinking, that this could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. And look at verse number 10. Why do you bother this woman? For she has done a good deed to me. Notice what he says. He, he defends the woman. He is our advocate. He defends the woman, but it sounds cold. Well, you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. I mean, that, that sounds somewhat callous to say that. It, it, it would be like someone who is um, saying, well, you know, the poor can wait their time, but there he is, he's, he's bathing in this luxury, if you will. How do we understand that? And, and the only way to understand this is, is timing. It is the timing of it is how we can understand this. It is time for Jesus to die. Now, our Lord, as we look at his ministry, his earthly ministry, we, we know that he had a place in his heart for the poor. He identified with the poor. But it's the timing on it. This is why he says it, because of the timing. The poor you will always have with, with, with you, but you do not always have me. Question, how is it that he says here, that you do not always have me, but then in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, where we have the Great Commission, he says, I will be with you always to the end of the time. How do we reconcile those two things? You're not always going to have me with, me with you, but I will always be with you to the end of the age. And the way we reconcile that is that you're not going to always have him with you in this earthly ministry, even in this body that he's in then. This body's being uh, anointed, and this, this body is going to, to die. This, die. this body is going to be buried, but he will be raised from the dead in the resurrected body. And when Jesus speaks about us being, him being with us to the end of the age, it is through the power of the Spirit through his spirit that is with us. The Passover has come. The time of his presence with his disciples has come to an end. And it's with this, that this account as we consider this, that all of this is taking place at the beginning of the Passion narrative. It's the climax of the story of Jesus. And here we are, talking about money, talking about what something costs. I mean, Matthew was a tax collector. You can see where he would talk about money. 
But what, what's the significance in them? I mean, why, why, were, why are we talking about money? And, and why bring out this story? And I think we're talking about what the cost is that she did. She, she in their minds, she wasted a whole years of wages. But this woman serves as our example. She, she's the only one there that is interested in honoring the Lord Jesus. She gives extravagantly because she's given to Jesus. Why this great offering? Why, why this great offering? I mean, we, we, we answered some of the technical part about the anointing and preparing for burial. But why this great offering? It's because he is more valuable than precious gold. He, he is more valuable than silver. He, he's more valuable than precious stones. He, he's more valuable than this perfume that was poured out. He's more valuable even than the poor. This Jesus is more valuable than anything or anyone. He's the object of our worship and our adoration. Father, we pray, Lord, as we see this example of Mary, an example that reminds us of the value and the worth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would not worship him half-heartedly or with little. Lord, that we would understand that there is a great cost in worshiping you in spirit and the truth. Lord, that we would take up our cross, denying ourselves that we would follow you. And Lord, that we would be willing to sacrifice the friends and family members, our positions, our wealth, our security. Lord, that we would be willing to cast all those things aside. simply because we have Jesus. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen.